Hey guys, heavy things lightly today, Justin Brierly. Yeah, if you don't know who he is, you should. He's doing in Europe what a lot of people are doing over here. He's bringing people together and there's this crazy ice breaking thing that he's doing where people are actually talking to each other about Christianity. His is the reform tradition. Today, we talk about all kinds of things, including what is the church. He takes the lightometer test, and he talks to us about his wonderful, well, his vision. Also, before we go and get into it, Art of Tamada. That's where, I don't know, First Things Foundation hosts an amazing fundraiser, 7th through 10th of July this year, out near Seattle and Leavenworth, 7th through 10th. In November, two different Art of Tamadas this year. That one is in Isle Morada, Florida, in the Keys. We'll be putting out prices and details this week, and I can't wait. And now, a little music to bring us in. You're kind of like a mentor to me. I got to explain oh, really? this to you. Look, I was teach. I did international aid, and then I was in Peace Corps, and I lived in Africa, and the Georgian Republic, and Haiti, and... And then I started teaching and in teaching, I saw what was going on in the schools in New York City and down in Naples, Florida, where I taught. And then I came across your podcast. I'm an Orthodox guy, right? So I converted mm. and um, I was an Anglican or Episcopalian. My father was Episcopal priest. And uh, so I like I know the Protestant world or whatever you want to call it, the Reformed world. But I would, became Orthodox, and then Georgia took over my life, and this this crazy country changed the way I mm. saw Christianity. And then I come across your podcast. But you got to understand, I'm like, I'm like a battler against Reformed Christianity when I start listening to you. But I realize what you're doing. At least I think I realize what you're doing. That's why I want to ask you a couple questions mm. because mm. it was brilliant. Um, so. I fell in love with your work. And so I tell my friends here, because, you know, I just interviewed, I was with Martin Shaw, with Jonathan Peggio. I was the host of mm. of that symbolic world. And I brought light stuff. I, I did comedy routines. and mm. But then I sat with them and threw a dinner with Martin and Jonathan Peggio and Father Stephen DeYoung, who you got to get on. Mm. You'd really like him. Um so I'm getting to a question, I promise, Justin. I'm just yeah, talking. it's fine. It's fine. But, I'm uh, enjoying listening. <laughs> so what what happened was is nobody, you're like, everybody knows you in Europe in, in Christian circles, but nobody, I was like, you don't know this guy. You don't know who this guy is. <laughs> and so I'm like, I got him on. He's coming on. <laughs> and I started <laughs> to realize, I met this guy, um, John and uh, Ruslan, who are two big, two yeah. big evangelical, they were there at the dinner with me. Ah, cool. And uh, with Martin Shaw, he was telling stories. Long story short, they knew who you were, but <laughs> uh, this little corner, for whatever reason, it's because of Orthodox or weird people. We don't know, but I know. And so I got to ask you something, guys, this is Justin Briley, and <laughs> Here's the thing. When I started listening to you, I realized it was right. New, new atheism was powerful. This is an early 2000, mm. we're middle 2000s, uh, 10, 205, 6, 7. And um, I was like, this guy's getting hammered. <laughs> like you were not, it just couldn't be you were the European voice of, of reason. You, it, you felt undermanned. But right. let me ask you this question. Did you just have the faith and the idea that if people talk, the spirit of goodness will just win? Did you, is that what you're operating I, I, under? I, I guess. I guess something like that. Yeah. I I mean, I really started the unbelievable show to hopefully model what good conversations could look like between Christians and non Christians. But as you say, it, it did come out in this very heightened time of the new atheism when there was a lot of very dogmatic anti-theism around and um yeah I, I guess i guess it was the kind of show where i just had to let the cards fall where they will yeah. and i would have a christian on i'd have frequently have an atheist on opposite the christian and 
it, you know, it would be down to them really what the show was. Um, there was no sort of script for it. There was yeah. no, you know, we would obviously share with each other what we were planning to discuss, but it could go in any direction really during the hour or so of recording. And then, yeah, let the audience decide what they made of it. Um, and to be honest, it is a slightly less safe version of quote unquote Christian apologetics than, you know, just hearing from the one side, which is the way it often works. Now, there's nothing wrong with having those kinds of shows where you just hear the Christian perspective on things. But I really liked the the way in which it, it felt very real having those conversations with with actual people, which could go off in any direction oh. and where you couldn't necessarily say this side one or that side one. Um, and that's that's real life, in my opinion. That's that's the way normal conversations actually happen. So, yeah, I guess in the long run, I, I was confident that that if someone listened for long enough, they may not hear like the atheist getting slammed every every time or anything like that. But what they will hopefully hear is enough interesting, sensible, intelligent Christians to realize, well, this isn't you know, Christianity isn't just fairy tales. Um, there are there are That's enough it. intelligent people here talking about it. To, that means there must be something, something to it, maybe. Um, so, so yeah, that was my hope that 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 I guess through all of that, God God would work, and and I feel like you know God did work in the end. Well, there was like you were. First of all, when I say you were getting slammed, you weren't getting slammed, but but there wasn't that the spirit of the culture, at least in America, was. You know, the Christians were silly. But I will say this, your humanity came through and your patience. And by the way, I there are a lot of good guests who also demonstrated a lot of humanity as atheists mm. and as mm. non-believers. And, but you were like uh, just patient and consistent and to continue to be um, your Thank new you. work. Why don't you tell us about... So unbelievable is still going on. It's still fantastic. But you're doing surprising rebirth podcast now. Would That's you right. Just tell us about that. Yeah, yeah. It was it was uh, nearly nearly a year ago. I actually moved on from the unbelievable show, which was a really bittersweet goodbye to a show I had started and hosted for over seventeen years. So um, you know, a lot of memories, a lot of experience. Um, but it was it was just the right time for me to start to move on to some new projects. So unbelievable continues in in other hands but i um i had a new book coming out called the surprising rebirth of belief in god which very much built on a lot of those conversations and the way that i'd seen the conversations change from that very dogmatic new atheist tone of the mid 2000s to actually something quite different in the last several years where i've seen a lot more sympathetic voices even on the non-christian side mm -hmm. towards the value of faith mm -hmm. and i wanted to write about that and some of the interesting people who i'm seeing now as new atheism has sort of faded away for all kinds of reasons the way that i think there's a new appreciation of the value of faith and and even a new kind of hunger a spiritual hunger that i'm noticing among people who are sort of tired or disillusioned with secular materialism mm -hmm. so so that's that's what the book's about whether we may be seeing a turning of the tide um when it comes to faith and and then on top of that um yeah a new podcast series that goes with it a documentary podcast series where we do a really deep deep dive in a documentary style into these various issues some of these characters you know people like jordan peterson tom holland douglas murray people kind of who aren't necessarily Christian per se, but, but who are more and more kind of saying things about the fact yeah. that we, we can't really do without Christianity. Um, and just, and just, yeah, telling the story as well of the rise and fall of new atheism in the process. And, uh, it's been real fun. It's been, you know, really interesting new project that, that goes alongside a number of other things I've been doing, writing, speaking, other podcast hosting, but the real, yeah, the real big kind of focus has been the surprising rebirth of belief in God, both, as a book and as a documentary podcast series. That's how we got connected because Paul Kings North has become a, a type of internet friend. And he said, well, I'm doing this thing. The same day he was doing, I think his talk with you, I called him or I, I reached out and I said, I sure would like to meet that Justin Brierley character. He was like, that's so weird because I'm actually talking to him today. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I love Paul and I've been, I've been following his story, obviously, since ever since he published his sort of story in First Things, The Cross and the Machine, which which is just a fantastic read if anyone hasn't hasn't yet read that. But um, 
yeah i got him in conversation first of all while i was still with unbelievable um mm -hmm. opposite rowan williams um who's former archbishop of canterbury here i heard that but v very interested in um you know I, I think orthodoxy and that kind of thing in fact i think he sort of at one time as a young man himself was tempted to go the orthodox route but uh, they had a great conversation and then yeah i was able to speak to paul again for this this new podcast i started shortly after i left unbelievable called reenchanting uh, it's a it's a show where we aim to sort of talk to interesting characters with and without faith um about how to re-enchant a secular yeah. post-christian world with the christian vision of reality and and of course, Paul Kingsnorth is a is a wonderful guest for that kind of thing because he's got such a such an interesting story and and I've woven it into some episodes of this new documentary series and and I do tell his story in the book as well. So yeah, um, love love Paul, love all that he's doing. He's an intense guy, and and you do a great that the production value is really high. I recommend everybody go check it out. It's it's beautiful stuff. So here's a question for you: What does it look like this reenchantment? in Europe. Okay, so two questions. Is Europe really this a lot of Americans understand as the bastion of the beginning of sort of the deistic atheistic movement and that it's pretty hard hard hardwired into European culture that atheism is expected of people. Mm. Is that true? Do we have that is it is it true that Europe looks that way? I'm I'm including uh, England in this. And, yeah, I think I think I think uh, overall, yes, Europe is, you know, a very post-Christian part of the West. Um, and even though it was, you know, the place where many Christian traditions were birthed, you know, the Lutheran Church in Germany, various sort of forms of Protestantism that came through UK, the UK and and so on. I feel like it is in large parts a, a very tough ground for for mm -hmm. Christianity. Um I, I have a sister who lives in France and whenever I go to France, I do feel like it's, it's, it's actually more skeptical there. There's, there's, it's a harder terrain to sow into than in the UK. Interestingly, I think there's, there's more of a kind of openness to Christianity actually in the UK. So it does vary from country to country. I think also um, in many parts of, you know, the Scandinavian countries and elsewhere, again christianity just feels like a, a relic of of the past you know when i've been into the churches there um they they had this you know amazing reformed tradition but it feels like that's a long long time ago and people are essentially you know very liberal secular people um as i say that that may not be the story forever but that's certainly where it's been and what the statistics tell us you know i guess the the Europe and the UK especially have always been a couple of decades ahead maybe of where America is in terms of secularization mm -hmm. and so to that extent I think what's been interesting is to to see the way that some of these that 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 tide of secularism has kind of obviously continued to manifest itself in the US as well it's quite different in the US I find because the relationship between the church and the state and religiosity is is quite a different beast can you in, feel it in the u.s can you feel it in the u.s because you've come yeah. over and done some events when when i come to the u.s it is very different because partly because there isn't nearly so much of a kind of alliance of um religion and politics as there is in the the usa so you just get a far more of a a sense that that people's politics and their religious life is kind of intertwined far more in the usa just doesn't really exist here that there, there you 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 could meet a christian and you wouldn't necessarily know who they vote for by any stretch it's, uh, the it's just it's just not yeah it's just a very different thing here and also do they they choose sort of inside outside vocabulary like unless they're in a christian setting they won't speak in christian ways do you find that in europe yeah i i guess to that extent it's harder to live in a christian bubble in europe um mm. you i think that's probably the case in parts of america you you can sort of it, it's it's easier to, to to sort of more or less find yourselves quite often surrounded by more or less similar folk you know similar christians in large numbers obviously not not everywhere sure but in the uk especially you you yeah it's very un it's quite unusual to go to church it's it's kind of something you make a deliberate choice about it's not sort of just 
part of the culture in that sense. And and so, yes, um, I think folk in the UK are far less likely to kind of just assume a kind of Christianese or Christian language around people, you know, um, uh, in everyday life. Uh, where, whereas I could imagine in America, there are there are some bubbles where that's that can still happen, you know. Here's the thing. Do you find that, uh, do you find that culturally, if you're, I don't know, in France or Europe or you're, you're working, right? Do you find that there's some sort of, um, uh, a respect level is returning to sort of interfaith dialogues? Is, is it, is it cool again in Europe to, to, to share these kinds of ideas, um, the mystical ideas or semi-mystical ideas with people? Has it gotten to that point? I wouldn't say it's got to the point where it's cool again, um, but I would say something has changed in the atmosphere where it's possible to speak in broadly Christian terms without being seen as a complete weirdo uh, any longer. Um, and I think, so the, the difference I would say is is definitely that the tone has changed in these kind of public discussions around faith. Mm. Whereas you go back 15 or 20 years to the height of the new atheism when Richard Dawkins, Sam Harris, Christopher Hitchens were all had their, their best-selling atheist books. We had things like the Atheist Bus Campaign in London, these, these buses bearing the slogan, there's probably no God, now stop worrying and enjoy your life. And, and all that kind of thing. And, and they were kind of riding a kind of wave, really, of this quite dogmatic, sceptical anti-theism. Um, and it was, I think, just much harder to sort of talk a, about faith or have it taken seriously in the public square. Mm. Whereas I do see that that, that has changed. Um, and really, a large part of the book and my podcast documentary series is is about that and about the ways in which certain characters in particular, I think, have kind of had quite an impact on the culture. Um, so Jordan Peterson being a good example of someone who, whatever you think of his, his politics or, or whatever, he's had this outsized influence on a large demographic of young men, a very similar demographic to the ones who had been turning up for the new atheists, mm -hmm. but pointing them back towards the Bible and as a sort of a, a deep source of meaning and wisdom and, you know, uh, and the symbolism teaming up with obviously people like Jonathan Pajot and others in sort of tracing how the Bible speaks to us across all times, places and cultures. And suddenly, you know, a lot of people who had completely dismissed the Bible and religion kind of just taken their cues from the new atheists, suddenly waking up to the fact, oh, this this might have more than I realized going mm -hmm. for it. Um, even the door even being open for some to actually walk through to become Christian. So I've I've met people who are now Christians and Jordan Peterson played a significant part in in that journey. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I, I just I just found it really interesting that that there was this kind of renewed sort of openness to scripture, to the value of religion. Um, and even among people who haven't, you know, who don't believe it, who are still very skeptical of organized religion. I rarely find that outright kind of dismissal yeah. where people say it's it's evil, it's delusional. You know, that was the the normal motto, the normal slogans of the new atheism. Whereas I've met a lot of what I might call ex new atheists now who have just grown out of that and say, actually, I've come to realize we're inherently religious. You know, we, people oh, this is... just get religious about different things. And if it's not Christianity, it's going to be something else. And so a lot of that is coming through in the way that people are now getting really, you know, really behind certain social justice issues, ideologies, treating them in kind of quasi religious ways. And I think a lot of the new atheists have realized all we did by kind of trying to clear the ground from Christian faith is, is open up the space for a whole other set of quasi-religious beliefs to kind of fill yeah. that vacuum. Which... And, and, and so it's really interesting talking to some of these folks and seeing the way that they themselves have kind of almost mellowed towards Christianity. Some of them saying, actually, I think I preferred <laughs> the Christian faith to the, the new quasi-religions that are now floating around in academia, you know, where actually they're, they're far more dangerous in a way to, to freedom of speech and, and so on um so so it's been an interesting you know decade or so where where i think that shift has happened i uh when i when i converted i start well i spent time in mali uh west africa with muslims and i started to realize something and this it'll lead to my question which is 
it's kind of impossible to not have something bind your world together. So mm. it, it, maybe it's an ideology. I, I'm not sure I understand. That's my question is, is I'm not sure what you, what you mean by religion, although I think I have an idea. But what I started to realize is the old Latin, the old ancient Greek way of understanding religion is that which binds. And there's something about all mm. of us that binds a worldview so mm. that we can make meaning out of the world. Yeah. And um, that idea makes sense to me. So the question is not really if you're religious. The question is, is who, what's your God or what's your yeah. ultimate good? Mm. Um, and so is that similar to how you understand yeah. religion in, in your life or in the life of human beings? Yeah, I, I guess I'm, I was using religion more in, in the, the way it's generally kind of used um, to, to mean something spiritually about um, supernatural beliefs in you know, I God, see, heaven, angels, and so on. That's that's the, the common way in which most people kind of think religion. And so they often think non-religious is, you know, the secular space where, you know, which science, don't invoke those science? kinds of things. Yeah, science yeah. and, yeah. you know, reason, uh, so on. I, but I, I actually agree with you. I think I think at a, a at a more important level that religion is could could be characterized as, as as you say the binding together of things. That religio is is that's exactly what it meant, isn't it? In the Latin, and so I would say yes. Um, to that extent, we're all religious, whether we think of ourselves as religious or not, because we all have something you know which is the thing mm -hmm. to which we you know, pay our dues, which, which is the thing at the top of the hierarchy right. where, which right. is serves in the, in the place of God. Um, so I, yeah, I, I'd agree entirely. Um, I think a lot of people don't realize actually just how religious they are. I mean, even the new atheism in a funny way was quite religious oh, yeah. in the end. Oh, yeah. it, it was, it, it had all the trappings in a way of traditional religion. It, it had high priests in the form of these four horsemen. It had their sacred texts that they had written. It had, it certainly had an orthodoxy, a, a kind of creed, uh, which was scientific materialism. And if someone, you know, diverted from that, then they were rounded upon as as heretics. And, you know, the, these gatherings to praise the wonder of science, you know, that was kind of the great savior. It, it was all very religious in, in a funny way. And I just think that that instinct is there, whether you think of yourself as religious yeah. or not, it, it will manifest in some way. Yeah. And then the next thing is, is how does the manifestation inculcate itself in culture? And so now it gets, it gets messy, right? Because that's when people start to root for a certain manifestation because they're comfortable with it. For instance, in the East, you know, mm -hmm. I'm, I love the Georgian Republic and I'm rooting for them to manifest that ancient Christianity as per 2024. But there are other religios in play, you know, there's the secular religio, there's the sort of Russian imperial religio. And um, I find the danger is when I start rooting and leave my Christian roots, which is love. And, and I, mm. I start to root as someone with a pike or an ax mm. <laughs> who wants mm. to mm. move culture toward my religio. And that, 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 mm. That's really mm. an interesting, how do we, like you, you're English, how do you root for a return without becoming political? It's tricky, yeah. right? It is. It's it's super tricky. Um, and I, I guess I guess ultimately, you know, I, I try, I do my best, and encourage, would encourage others to to put their faith in in Christ, um, not in the institutions and the systems that we tend to build um, mm. around religion. Now we need those inevitably. We can't do without sort of the, 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 the thing that, you know, that within which we travel together, the church or uh, right. the institution and so on. But, but I, the, the mistake would be to mistake that for the, the actual object of our faith. And when I look at Christ, when I look at the way he's revealed to us in the gospels, um, when I look at the way he has been, uh, interpreted by the church fathers and so on, I I see an incredible example of someone who was able somehow to transform people, to transform the world, but do it without actually wielding the instruments of power that typically get used in the That's world. Right. Um, right. 
somehow he managed to transcend that. And that obviously has to be our example. Uh, there's a huge um, temptation, I think, yeah. to use this kind of renaissance that I'm seeing of the value of religion, observance, the psychological benefits and so on of Christianity to sort of put that into a certain political framework and yeah. start to use it as a um, another kind of way of trying to, you know, get your political agenda in play. I can I can see the attraction for that, but I think that is a misstep because um, that it will become as dead as a kind of any progressive left version of, of the, the wheels religion in that way. I, I just think that's that we have to be very careful. Um, I've had one or two little conversations with Paul Kingsnorth about that. And I think he he also feels there's a great danger there of trying to, yeah, trying to kind of bring this movement into a kind of political framework. Yeah. Um, it's not that we that we are inevitably political, so we can't avoid that. But it's it's when you try to kind of say, well, this is a, you know, this is the property of <laughs> The right wing or the left wing or, or anything else um, i love that I, I love that yeah yeah well so I, I don't know i don't that's probably not a great answer because i it, it, that's not really giving anyone any practical help as to how they do it i just all i can say is keep your eyes on jesus because he tends to confuse both sides and um you know and i'd, I'd rather kind of be on his side than than joe biden or trump or whatever, uh, yeah, kind of. yeah i always i laugh with my dearest friends you know, and they all tend to be philosopher theology types. Um, whenever it's confusing and there's deep paradox and you're like, I don't get this, you're probably right over the Christian target. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> like stay right there because if yeah. it becomes yeah. too easy, you've got a plan that is going to yeah. turn up fascist or communist. It's going to, or, or, mm. or mm. capitalist, I hate to, you know, the market has its own rules and I mm. find people worship the market too. And Christians yeah. have done. I'm, I mean, Ka Calvin said, I think something like the human heart is a perpetual idol factory. And we are, and we can mm. take something good. Frequently an idol is something good in itself, you know, that, that in its right place is, is fine, is great. But when you put it in the place of God, suddenly yeah. it all falls apart. And, and that's what usually happens with politics or with an ideology or anything. It, it can often start from a very good place, but, but when you sort of then put it in the place of God, suddenly it becomes tyrannical and demonic and, yeah. and everything else because yeah. it turns out that shouldn't be God. God that, that thing, you know, anything but God in God's place, you know, lets right. us down or, or, or kind of controls us in that way. I have a dear friend who comes on our podcast. And by the way, our podcast, I think you know that, so we actually do aid and assistance all over the world in a sort of a real simple way. We, we send people for two years, they embed in local communities. Uh, we're in Mozambique, Sierra Leone. I'm talking like mud huts and mm. get malaria and, 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 and live simply. And the idea is to identify folks in those local communities who are just brilliant, but they may not have gone to school for more than two or three years. They're, they're, they're literally in the, most beautiful sense, old world people mm. who have not gone through this enlightenment. They haven't become, but now there's a lot of problems with that, but they haven't become um, uh, enlightened. And, and I say that not necessarily in the way that maybe people think yeah. it's, it's, it, they may be actually the enlightened ones on some level. So, mm, mm, mm. but I, I bring in all this up because what we, what we find in our work is there's a simple, there's a simplicity to human relationships that I think most old cultures just knew politicians as not them, not hmm. it's, it's hmm. like the Greeks say they do their thing. We do ours. Hopefully they do it for us every now and then, but we don't expect that. That's the old world hmm. political hmm. matrix, hmm. which is hmm. like, that's not for me. Yeah. I had a woman in my village tell me in Mali, she's like, I don't, we don't do that. We just let mm. the chief handle that, and mm. it's a very unique thing. But what I what it what it taught me there in Mali was that, like, there are some things I'm not ever going to be able to weigh in on and be a part of, and it's not my purview. And 
democracy implies I can always be involved. And mm -hmm. I'm not sure it's that's always in alignment with human nature. Yeah, it, it gives us a yeah. false sense of ourselves sometimes. Yeah, yeah. It's interesting, isn't it? Um, I, I mean, I spent some time in Africa. Um, I took a gap year just after getting married with my wife. And we, we spent about eight months in Namibia. And uh, we had a wonderful time there. Um, really got to know um, the people that we were part of the community with. We were in the very northern strip of Namibia, where most of the population lives on the border of Angola. Mm. And we were living on a traditional Anglican mission. Um, so there was a church, a hospital, a school. Um, and what I really appreciated about it was um, that, yeah, a completely different culture to the one I came from. Um, but so at one level, so much more integrated with with the earth, with yeah. their surroundings. You know, the, yeah. these people literally knew where the food they were eating came from because they were growing it right. and they were raising it, you know, the chickens on their homestead. And they were, um, I, I never forget the, the day that we were due to leave and fly home. One of these friends we'd made, they brought us a, a chicken to take home with us. It was a live chicken. We said, oh, we can't, we can't take this with us. But they, uh, they went, they went Beautiful. away. They, they, they plucked it. They cooked it. They brought it back for us so we could take it on the journey with us. And uh, <laughs> it was amazing. But I say all this just to say these were Christians as well. Um, and they were, um, what I loved about it was that obviously the way they expressed their faith was very different to mine, that the, the nature of the worship, the, um, you know, the, just because of, you know, it's culturally instantiated in, in a different way, but yet they were these brothers and sisters in Christ and the way in which the Christian faith had, um, rather than kind of squashing their culture, it had kind of brought all the best aspects I felt yeah. of their culture yeah. out. Um, and so some things had, had to go things like polygamy, which was very common in that part of the world, but that was a good thing. Women were far better off without the kind of polygamous, um, you know, and that was a, that, but that was a tough call. If you were going to become a Christian, you couldn't have more than one wife. And that was, you know, that, that was a significant break. You know, they, this was not a kind of something that didn't come without a cost in a sense, socially and culturally. And yet, um, it just, it, I could just see all the ways in which Christianity had then just worked well, um, mm -hmm. and brought out the best in, in people in, in all kinds of different ways. So I, I only say that this, it doesn't connect that much with what you were saying, but, but my, my experience is, is that, uh, you don't, it doesn't have to be a sort of Western Christianity in a sense that, that has to prevail or a Western kind of model, if you like, it, it will, Christianity will find its, its zone in in the culture in which it gets embedded and and that's what i've always appreciated about it in that way that's what i 100 percent agree that's what led me to orthodoxy in the end when i was getting these international experiences and and i'll be honest so this is you want a tough question because this is the one i would say all those years when i was listening to and and really i was getting formed up in this thing that i'm trying to do now you were teaching me a lot about how to have a conversation and I mean that I'm really, really thankful. But the one time I would always sort of yell into the to the volume button <laughs> was there is a for lack of a better term, because I know that evangelicals and Protestants don't like certain labels, reform Christian. I don't I don't know the right terms, mm. but there is a there's a usage of small o orthodox these days. That's really fascinating. Mm. And mm. just so you know, which I'm sure you do super well you know well versed in all the religion the christian world but for orthodox people that use of the small o is weird it it's mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. to be a you know there's a lot of talk about the church and christians and church and christians ruslan too on his show for orthodox it's a it's a weird sound when mm. you guys use o small o and we always i guess the question is what is the church? Because I think you could argue ecclesiology is the break. It mm. is the divide that if you're a new atheist looking in on weaknesses or whatever, and then mm. mm. it's our inability to really discuss clearly what the church is. So how do you do it? Mm. How do you know what 
the church and small O versus big O orthodoxy? It's a, it's a, it's a messy question. I don't even yeah, know if it's clear. Yeah, it is, isn't it? it is. What is yeah. the church? How do you, how do you oh, see gosh. it? Yeah. I, you I guess don't have to answer because I no, love no, you. I, I don't want to I mean, I think, you, I think the, the thing about the, the big O and small O orthodox, it, it is a bit confusing because often when I'm using the phrase, oh, he's an orthodox Christian, I'm not talking about Eastern orthodoxy. Right. Um, I'm talking about simply he, he has um, conventional <laughs> Christian beliefs, I suppose. The, um, the, the You know, he, he agrees with the, the Nicene Creed or the... Okay, yeah. Christ is risen from the dead. How about that? Yeah, one? The, the 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 core beliefs, <clears throat> the essential core beliefs of Christianity: um, uh, Trinitarian deity of Christ, the resurrection. You know those sorts of things. Um, I would say that's that's often the way in which I'm I'm meaning orthodox. Um, obviously, um, I w- I would tend to yeah sort of uh, use use something else to to, to note when I'm talking about specifically the, the branch of the church, the Eastern Orthodox Church. Now. Um, as to ecclesiology, yeah, I mean, I would say that, uh, I have quite a broad kind of sense of the church. I, I obviously know something of the, what happened, you know, over the centuries when the various splits happened between East and West and then reformed and Catholic and everything else. I guess my view is that, that God does work in and through all of those traditions um, I, I find myself obviously in the Protestant tradition and I don't feel called to move out of that into orthodoxy or Catholicism or anything else. Um, I suppose I've got a kind of, and I'm certainly, and I'm not a kind of the kind of Protestant who says, well, the Orthodox are all damned and the Catholics are all damned because they don't believe in whatever. So there's some of those, we got some of those here in the States. For yeah. Sure. So, I, and I've met them too. Um, but I'm not one of them. And, um, I suppose, yeah, it, for me, the church is um, the people of God um, who worship the risen Jesus as their Lord and Savior and uh, have trusted in him for their salvation. And um, that's that's going to throw the net quite wide. Um, I totally accept that I'm going to have Orthodox and Catholic friends who will say, well, I, I can call you a brother in Christ, Justin. I just don't think you have the full deposit of faith or whatever it might be, you know, um, I, I get that's, that. That's, that's fine. I'm, I'm, I'm cool with that. Um, we, I'm happy to be proved wrong when we all get there in the end. Uh, if, if, if it turns out I should have been Orthodox, I, I will, I will happily spend eternity thinking, well, at least I know now, you know, so <laughs> we'll listen, here's, here's the thing. I knew you would, I'm just thankful to be able to ask that. But my job is, as an Orthodox Christian who believes the church is the church or whatever is is to not go the next step and now try to pin you down. It's mm. not really relevant to our conversation. What mm. I mean by that is between souls. Now, watch. Somebody's going to come at me at, in the comments who's going to be an Orthodox Christian who wants to pin down yeah. to go to – the Bible became an idea and an idol itself. There's a whole mm-hmm. series of conversations now where we could replay the Reformation. I personally want to replay the Reformation, me and you, but over a drink quietly. <laughs> you know what I mean? Where yeah. we've already established that 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 we're together in a spiritual mm-hmm. way as human beings. Mm-hmm. I do think though, if this beautiful I love the title of your the surprising rebirth of Christianity. I do think if there is that rebirth, I do think all the conversations will end up, you know, like when you put a coin in one of those donation Mm. things and it goes down, 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 and Mm. eventually it drops into something like Mm -hmm. a bucket and you'd like Mm -hmm. gave your quarter. I do think it's going there at some point for me and you and all the rebirth people. I, 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 you might be right. You might be right. Um, I mean, what I've been surprised by actually is is the number of people I'm bumping into who, having come through the kind of secular thing, they are in fact finding themselves really attractive to either Catholicism or Orthodoxy. Yeah, the liturgical and, stuff. Um, yeah, and 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 I think a lot of that. Yeah, I think a, a partly that's about, a, a, yeah, an attraction to the aesthetic. It's it's it feels ancient. It feels like something 
very different to the kind of vapid kind of culture that we often live in now um and so that's so it's interesting to see people like martin shaw and paul kingsnorth and Mm -hmm. and others i could mention who have kind of gone that route um tom holland who i know quite well historian here in the uk um who's who's wrote the book dominion again he he attends a very anglo-catholic church Mm -hmm. i mean he is going to a church in church but it's like the oldest church in london it's very anglo-catholic it's kind of it's absolutely baked into that kind of mysterious almost otherworldly kind of worship and and that's where he just finds you know he he just loves that because it connects him with something that's way bigger than him you yeah. know and um so I, I i'm interested in that i because um i'm seeing i am seeing so many of these secular intellectuals going the kind of the orthodox or catholic route they're not necessarily plumping for you, you know your evangelical baptist church so um so yeah you might be onto something there you might it might be that that, that the rebirth is actually you know is, is a rebirth to something much older rather than something newer and it would make sense in history again that's not to that's not to make judgments about uh, you know i was a uh, orthodox missionary in, in haiti and we had to pray for that place it's it's coming apart as we speak, mm. but um, the most interesting conversations, Justin, is is the evangelical folks who would come over to our house where we had icons and where we had, you know, we had burned crosses as a mm. type. It's the Serbians over the doorways where you come in, you burn a little cross at each year as a it's a house mm. blessing, and they would come into the house. Mm. more than one and they would stop and go why do you have a voodoo house (laughs) that happened and i'd be like no this is our house they go did you have these paintings and this crosses what are you doing and i was like well come on in and eventually (laughs) we'd sort it and it was so fascinating because we would then both go out to port-au-prince and talk to haitians Mm. and i started to realize during those years that there's two conversations going on there's sort of you know the one happening between us and then the one happening with us and others that are outside of both conversations. Um, And there's just some sorting there. And by the way, I'm not a, I'm not a a wrist turner. I'm not, I'm not into that. I don't think it's helpful, but uh, I think you and I will have a talk again. I think something's going to break. So that's my, here's the last question for you or a couple. Mm. I I love talking Mm. to you. I'm so blessed. So, um, it's going to keep going. We're, I, I don't know how old you are, but I'm, I'm not young. And, and my kids are going to see something. What do you think it looks like? This, this, this Christianity that's coming back mm. or something. What does it look this like rebirth. in two generations? Yeah. I, I mean, I'm not a good prophet of these things. All I really, the main thing I'm doing in the book and the podcast is kind of pointing out where I think I can see the tide turning where it goes is, is going to be really interesting because it could, first of all, the thing is it could get worse before it gets better. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. There, there's a sense in which I think part of the reason why I'm seeing a number of people, especially kind of in those secular intellectual circles, starting to give Christianity a second look is kind of because the culture is coming apart. And, um, and I'm not this, this rebirth, I think will be catalyzed to some extent, the worse the culture gets and uh, the more polarized, the yeah. more, you know um crazy things things become and um so i think i think to that extent it could get worse uh, i'm not saying that there's going to be a sudden sort of influx of people into the pews and the churches necessarily but having said all that i do think that the history of christendom has always been a series of of deaths and rebirths mm-hmm. and and we should completely expect that and i i do sometimes feel like actually things do have you kind of do have to get the the cultural nominal Christianity of a previous generation or two does almost have to completely collapse before something new can be reborn. And and I do think that that's what is currently being reborn. I think there's also aberrations of this, you know, certain forms of political nationalism and so on, uh, Christian nationalism in the U S that, that again, are going to, are going to go off in different directions, but, but on, and are not necessarily going to be at all helpful and and they may have to kind of crash and burn as well before the real thing kind of starts to to flower in its place so so whatever that looks like um it could it could well mean that a lot of 
current denominations that are on the slide could could go into extinction. I mean, I that you know again, history is littered with movements that started, flourished for a while, and then collapsed. You know, it's and I don't think in that sense God is specifically concerned with you know this very specific movement over here or there or wherever um to say this i think god god the church will prevail but it may not look you know your yeah. local church may not prevail you know that's that's the point um so we'll see what happens as, as as all that plays out what i do get the sense of as we were just saying is that um the kind of fashionable progressive versions of christianity or politicized versions of christianity will 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 perish eventually yeah yeah because um they can't sustain people and they can't sustain themselves and it is going to be that if you like the old the older uh and the weirder forms of christianity that i think people are going to go back to because actually they're looking for for the sacred they're looking for you know yeah. something mm -hmm. like that and and i just i get the sense that that that's where people are looking there they um they're fed up with just I don't know, just secular light kind of Christianity. Um, they're fed up with something that just looks like what they can already get down the road, you yeah. know, at the pop concert or wherever. I, I just get the sense people are interested in something that's that feels different. Um, and that's what I'm hearing, as I say, from a lot of those secular. Well, you have a good to. ear. You have you you have the ear for me anyway in Europe. You're hearing it. And can we do something fun to end? Yeah, I know sure. you can't just hang on with me all day long. Could, could well first of all here's the, the, the one fun thing you've interviewed a million people do you have one or two that stands out i love this stuff like th where you're just like <laughs> this is crazy this 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 is this is not what i thought it was going to be do oh, you have an interview well, like that it's it it's like it's like asking me to choose between my kids john honestly that there, there, there's so many and they're <laughs> too much they're all so special okay um, no um i i mean one one that i do come back to quite often uh, just because it, um, I, I featured it on the podcast documentary series not long ago, um, it is again someone I've mentioned already, Tom Holland, um, historian here in the UK, hugely yeah, he's great, popular. He run he co-hosts the Rest is History podcast. Has a fascinating story himself of having, you know, as a secular liberal, starting to research the world of the Greeks and the Romans, coming to realise just how much all of his beliefs about equality, dignity, progress really come from the christian revolution and and to that extent he would say he he realized he is actually a christian in 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 most respects he's gone on an interesting journey himself spiritually actually and and he opened up more candidly than he ever has done i think a, a recent conversation event i had with him in london just a week or two ago and you'll be able to hear that again on the great, documentary great. series soon um uh yeah he he's he's had some interesting experiences but but the show that sticks in my mind was a really sparky one when he came on just shortly after his his best selling book Dominion got published, and he engaged with an atheist philosopher a c Grayling, and they just had a barnstorming debate where Tom Holland really took Grayling to task over his version of Christian history. I remember whether that. basically that they Grayling's big book on this started with the claim that essentially Christians trashed antiquity and we'd be so much better off and we wouldn't have had the dark ages if it weren't for those terrible Christians. Um, and, and Tom really took him to, to the woodshed <laughs> in that episode. Where he, <laughs> yeah, kind of, was something. he, 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 uh, so it was a, just a real fun listen, a bit of a guilty pleasure to, to, to kind of, um, yeah, be, be in the midst of that particular debate and just, just a super interesting one. So yeah, that, that would be my pick if you're going to go and listen out. to something from the archives. All right. Here's the tech last thing. I could stay on with you. I know, but you're busy. And can I, we, our podcast is basically talking old world, new world. So the idea mm -hmm. is, is there's something like an old world, something like a new world. You can characterize it culturally. It exists. It's real on some level, but Pajot is doing a lot of this too, mm -hmm. but what is it? So we devised this very scientific test. I gave it to Jordan Peterson last weekend to Jonathan <laughs> and, and Martin Shaw and all the people at this thing. Can I, it's five questions. Yeah, Can, go ahead. Let's do it. So we're just trying to figure out like, how do I know what kind of thinker I am? And again, it's science, which is kind of the conceit, right? I, I just mm -hmm. made this up in my like 
Okay. In, in my basement. But I think it's actually science. Here we go. You ready? Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Okay. So go ahead. when you die, and what you're going to do for each one of these, and I'll record the scientific data here for you. <laughs> okay. I'll record it with my pen. Uh, in because it's it's MIT stuff here. This is top line. I can see that. I can yes. see that. You can feel it's it. A double right? blind test that's going it's a on double right blind. here. Right, exactly. This is this is not <laughs> like what took place during the pandemic. This is real science. Here we go. <laughs> Are you ready? So you're gonna give a three, two, one, or zero. Three strongly agree. That seems right. super true. What you just said, mm. John. Mm. Two, uh, I agree mostly. Mm. One, I disagree mostly, and zero mm -hmm. is I strongly disagree. Okay. Three strongly agree, zero strongly disagree, two, one. Here we go. Turn on okay. the machine. I'm turning it on. Uh, when you die, Justin, mm -hmm. uh, you really won't die all the way. It's more like you'll be asleep somehow waiting for some sort of next world. Three strongly agree, two mostly agree, one disagree, Zero strongly disagree. Um, I think I think three strongly agree. Three. We don't have to explain it. It's it's science. We don't need the emotive parts, Justin. <laughs> <laughs> We're just just doing this. Okay, here's the next one. Mm -hmm. I I have to be. You know, I have a white coat on. I got to be. Serious uh, yeah, I can see. I can see you're fully prepared for this. You you've you've. I feel like I'm. I'm a subject of an experiment right now. Right. That's how it's got to yeah. be. We got to yeah. take, got to take the, the gray stuff out. Here we go. Mm. Gray matter out. Next question. The best way for you or for me, obviously it applies to both of us, but you're taking the test. The best way for you to know yourself is to ask someone else about you. Hmm. Okay. Uh, well, it would always depend on the person you asked, obviously. But um, <laughs> right, but I'm I'm going to say I. Again, I slightly agree. Yeah, I'm going to go. I'm going to go with a two. two. Yeah, on that one. Now I know both of us are enlightenment thinkers. We always want to question the test, but you can't question the test. Okay, because I'm going to say like, if you ask my wife, it might be different to if you ask someone else. Exactly. <laughs> Exactly. But again, the test is written in a way where you just answer, I just ask. Okay. Absolutely. I, I really respect it. <laughs> He's like, who is this guy? He's like, why am I doing this? Okay. <laughs> just keep going. We only have two, three more questions. Here's the third okay. question. Hmm. Uh, when you, Justin, carry a picture of someone that you love or or even hate, doesn't matter, but a picture of someone in your purse or your wallet, mm. you're actually carrying that person around with you. Like they're there somehow, like actually close to you somehow. It's hmm. an interesting one. Um, I'm going to say I, I'm going to say I slightly disagree with that. I'm going to go for one, one on that one. one. Mm. You're a very good subject, actually. I've had people <laughs> battle, but they always lose to the science. So here's the next question. <laughs> next question. Just two more to go. Um, respect isn't earned. Respect is owed by you to others. Respect isn't earned. Respect is owed by me towards others. I know I sense you want to rewrite the question. I can feel it. <laughs> oh, I'm having trouble with this one. Um, okay. I know you want to say it's Respect, both. Yeah. I know, mm, but come Okay. On. Respect is owed. Um, it, again, it all depends on what you mean by respect. But um, I'm going to say I, I slightly agree with that. Slightly one. agree it too. Yeah. Again, you, you really, you handled that well. Here's your last Thank question. You. Okay. I'm going to read this one just because this one's a little, I mess it up all the time. Um, you, Justin, you fully hope and expect to take care of your parents and have them live with you, preferably even in your house when they get old and, inf and infirm or 
if your parents aren't with us anymore, you fully expect your kids to live with you or you with them when you get old and infirmed. It's a full expectation of yours. I would say Guys, I... If you're just <laughs> listening, his face is priceless. He's like, why am I... I again, I, why is this happening to me? Yeah. So I'm going to say, you know, my honest answer is a, it's a two rather than a three. Though I'd like to live in a world where it is a three. Oh, I love that answer. I get that. That was a hard one. It's meant to... Mm pull mm. us moderns apart mm. Mm. so five them i'm adding now uh, we'll put in an adding sound there let's see five six seven eight nine ten you can tell math is not my strong suit that's why i outsource this to mit okay you scored a 10 would you like oh. to know Yes, I'd like to know where I sit between the old and the new world, Good. according to your well, super scientific here analysis. Here you go. I, I, by the way, watch this. I'm a pitch man. If you'd like to find <laughs> out more about our test, go to <laughs> www.first-things.org. Here, <laughs> come on, Justin. We're in the I same days right. on some level. Yeah, You're absolutely, just way better at it I'm, than me. Right, here's here's the okay. here's the. I can't wait to hear. <laughs> as a ten. Just so you know, you are not the sovereign. That would be 14 or 15, full retro. Mm. You are not that. You probably drink from a goblet. That's not you. <laughs> okay. Okay. You probably, if you are a sovereign, you there's a good chance you own a pre-Columbian handmade weapon. That's not okay. you. That's not All right. You. You're not a villager. There's a good chance you hate malls and places like Algeria welcome you with a red carpet. That's not you. That's not you. You're also okay. not a shining city dweller on the hill. That's where you love the modern world enough to trust Reddit. Uh, that's right. not you. But you are the suburbanite. Oh. Just at the tip of becoming a villager. You feel romantic about the old world, Justin. I you do. like the security of hierarchy, but hierarchy is mostly a word you'd rather read about in a book. Hmm. It feels like you want to obey your elders more than you actually do. There hmm. it is. Hmm. That's wow. you. Wow. Wow. I think you got me down to a T there. Yeah. It, the, the science works. <laughs> <laughs> what can I say? I don't, we've just, I told Jordan Peterson, we've destroyed psychology now. We don't need it anymore. We have the test. Well, those were really interesting questions and they did make me think actually. Um, Good. So thank you. Thank you for subjecting me to that. Yes, you were kind to take it. Mm. Um, I want to count you as my internet friend because I really do want to honor your work. Um, it's been helpful. So oh, thank, well, thank you. you. I'm, I'm really pleased to hear that, John. I, I'm, I'm always humbled whenever I hear of someone who, who for whom the, the, the body of work that I've put out has, has been helpful. Hope, hope the new projects continue to inspire and encourage. Uh, they do and they will. And I'm going to point everybody that direction in our little Orthodox corner of the world. Although we have a lot of non-Orthodox listening, mm. but anything cool you want to just let us know about that's coming up right around the corner for you. Oh, what's coming up. Um, well, as I said, um, I think people will be really interested in this uh, this recent conversation event I had with Tom Holland, um, and that's going gotcha. to be coming out just after Easter. Um, so um, if you go to justinbriley.com to get hold of the, the podcast documentary series, The Surprising Rebirth of Belief in God, if you want to support there, you get um, you do get early access as well to those sorts of episodes. So, um, so that's one thing to do. Um, yeah, and uh, we've got... I'm coming out to the States as well. We're making plans for coming out in August, probably California direction. So oh, I'm yeah? not sure whether, how close that'll be to where you, to where your friends and folk are, John, but um, that's where, that's where we'll be looking forward to sharing, sharing a bit about the book, um, about the podcast series and we'll see what happens next. Great. I may come see you. Hey, great. <laughs> it's just wonderful to be able to talk to you. So guys, Justin Briley, Justin, uh, I don't know. But let's let's have our paths cross one day, and yeah, um, definitely, I'll be in touch. Thanks for taking our silly test too. I appreciate it. Oh, thank thanks for having me on. It's been lovely to chat with you, John. Guys, 
That was, Justin, check out the Surprising Rebirth podcast where he does some amazing things. He did did an episode with Paul Kingsnorth and Martin Shaw, both people that are in this orbit that we're in. Uh, and heavy things lightly. Check out our sub stack. And check out, and please do this. Go and put your email in. Come on. We don't send you a lot of stuff. Go to www.first-things.org. Put in your email and you'll get... We do a lot of beautiful stuff. Podcasts, substacks. You hear from our guys in the field. You see our projects. Guys, we're a little asceticism machine where people go do hard stuff and they become transformed and their projects are transforming. And it's what we're about. At the core, hospitality is not something at a hotel, guys. It's called medicine. It's for the soul. And it's for those who give. And when you give hospitality, you become a Christian. I don't know how else to say it. Maybe you don't want to become a Christian. That's fine. Become whole. And that's what we're trying to do. Do the art of hospitality. Check us out. Art of Tomadas are coming. You can find them on the website. Mostly thank you. Great conversation. Justin's a high suburbanite. That was kind of fun. Peace out. See you next time. I'm heavy things lightly.